the virus was first reported in China. But the Chinese government underwent a month-long period of denial before finally acknowledging its presence. And after its presence was acknowledged, the World Health Organization took another month to declare it a public health emergency of international concern. But by then, the virus had spread globally and had already reached pandemic proportion. Welcome to the Why in History. I am Ajay Kaul and today we travel back in time and look at pandemics through history and what we learned or did not learn over the period of time. Infectious diseases become pandemics when they spread across the globe via carriers of the infection, which is essentially humans. Uh, infectious diseases like the Spanish flu spread exponentially as more and more soldiers got infected during World War I and continued to get deployed across the globe. Gradually, uh, as people develop immunities, receive vaccines, or otherwise shield themselves from the infection, the pool of possible victims dwindles until the virus can no longer sustain itself. The rate of infection in a pandemic is often described in terms of a reproduction number. That is the average number of new people that each sick person will infect. If this number is higher than one, even by a small amount, the disease is still spreading. Um, looking back in time, uh, the reproduction number of the Spanish flu was 1.49 when the disease first hit Geneva. and it converted to a whopping 3.75 in the second wave, which came shortly thereafter. So if the number is less than one, the disease is on the decline. So now let us go back in time and look at some of the deadliest pandemics in history and look for any patterns or lessons that we should have learned. The bubonic plague or the Black Death that hit Europe and Asia in the mid 1300s claimed 200 million lives and is considered to be the deadliest pandemic in history. The plague arrived in Europe in October 1347 when 12 ships from the Black Sea docked at the Sicilian port of Messina. People gathered on the docks and saw a horrifying sight with most sailors aboard the ship dead and those that were alive uh, were gravely ill and covered in black boils that oozed blood and pus. Sicilian authorities hastily ordered the fleet uh, of these death ships out of the harbor, but it was too late. Over the next five years, the Black Death would kill a sizable chunk of the population in Europe, almost one third of the continent's population. Now, Europe at the time was not equipped uh, for the horrible reality of uh, Black Death. Blood and pus seeped out of uh, strange swellings, which were followed by a host of other unpleasant symptoms like fever, chills, vomiting, diarrhea, terrible aches and pains, and then, in short order, death. Today, we understand the Black Death as the bubonic plague, which is spread by a bacillus called Yersinia pestis. Um, the bacillus travels from person to person through the air, as well as through the bite of infected fleas and rats. And both of these pests were particularly prevalent aboard ships of all kinds during that time. And that is how the deadly plague made its way through Europe, one port city after another. And not surprisingly, the pandemic spread along the trade routes of the time. So from uh, Messina, it spread to the port of Marseille in France, to the port of Tunis in North Africa. Then it reached Rome and Florence. And then by the middle of 1348, uh, the Black Death had sp struck Paris, Bordeaux, Lyon, and London. It is estimated that the Black Death reduced the population of Europe by 30 to 60 percent. Uh, in total, the world population dwindled from 475 million to about 350 to 375 million in the 14th century. It took Europe about 200 years to recover to its previous level, and some regions like Florence only recovered to their original levels in the 19th century. 
since such a huge chunk of the population died, there was a major economic impact in Europe, and that essentially was the end of serfdom. After so many people died, the serfs were finally free to move to other estates that provided better conditions and receive top pay for their work. Since the population of the workers dwindled, they became more in demand and they were able to essentially see an improvement in their living conditions. The next big pandemic that we're going to talk about is the smallpox, which led to about 56 million deaths worldwide. Smallpox is thought to have originated in India or Egypt at least 3000 years ago. And the earliest evidence of the disease comes from the Egyptian pharaoh Ramses V, who died in 1157 BC, and his mummified remains show telltale pockmarks on his skin. The disease later spread along the trade routes in Asia, Africa, and Europe, and eventually reached the Americas in the 1500s. In February of 1519, the Spaniard Hernan Cortes set soil from Cuba to explore and colonize the Aztec civilization in the Mexican interior. Within just two years, Aztec ruler Montezuma was dead and the capital city of Tenochtitlan was captured and Cortes had claimed the Aztec empire for Spain. Spanish weaponry and tactics did play a role, but most of the destruction was brought about by the epidemic of smallpox that gradually spread inward from the coast of Mexico and decimated the densely populated city of Tenochtitlan in 1520, reducing its population by 40% in a single year. Indigenous populations in the Americas had never experienced this disease before the arrival of the Spanish and Portuguese explorers in the late 15th century, and therefore they had no immunity. Deadly smallpox pandemics raged through Mexico and Central America in the 1520s, and all the diseases brought unintentionally by the explorers and the invaders are thought to have led to a reduction in native populations by up to 90%. Smallpox is caused by an inhaled virus which causes fever, vomiting and rash and soon covering the body with uh, fluid filled blisters. These turn into scabs and uh, which leave scars and it's fatal approximately in one third of the cases and another third of those afflicted uh, will typically develop blindness. The ability of smallpox to incapacitate and decimate populations ended up making it the first agent of biological warfare. Yes, in the 18th century, the British tried to infect Native American populations using smallpox as the biological agent. One commander wrote, we gave them two blankets and a handkerchief out of the smallpox hospital. I hope it will have the desired effect. This deadly pandemic was finally brought under control through a vaccine by Dr. Edward Jenner. Jenner had noted that milkmaids, among others, who caught the cowpox from their animals rarely got sickened with smallpox. And so he resolved to test cowpox as a protection against smallpox. Jenner took material from a dairy maid's cowpox and introduced it into scratches on an eight-year-old boy's arms. He thus invented vaccination, a word which comes from the Latin for cow, vacca. Subsequently, mass vaccination against smallpox got going in the second half of the 1800s, and in 1980, the WHO declared smallpox eradicated. The next deadly flu is the Spanish flu of 1918, which led to 40 million casualties. But it is the closest we have with respect to the impact, the remedies, and lessons learned when we try to compare with the current COVID pandemic. The Spanish flu pandemic infected 
500 million people worldwide. And it happened around about um, the close of World War I. And it ended up killing approximately 40 million. That's more than all of the soldiers and civilians killed during World War I combined. So while the global pandemic lasted two years, the vast majority of deaths were packed into three months in the fall of 1918, which was described as the second wave caused by a mutated virus uh, spread by wartime troop movements. The flu first appeared in early March 1918. A U.S. Army cook at Camp Funston in Kansas was hospitalized with a 104-degree fever. The virus spread quickly through the Army installation, which was home to 54,000 troops, and by the end of the month, 1,100 troops had been hospitalized and 38 had died after developing pneumonia. As the U.S. troops got deployed for the war effort in Europe, they carried the Spanish flu with them. And through April and May of 1918, the virus spread through England, France, Spain, and Italy. Um, and an estimated three quarters of the French military was infected by the spring of 1918 and as many as half of British troops. Now, luckily, the first wave of the virus wasn't particularly deadly with symptoms like high fever and uh, malaise, usually lasting only three days, and mortality rates were similar to seasonal flu. And here's a piece of information I would like to share with the misinformed members of Congress. Uh, it was actually during this time that the Spanish flu earned its misnomer. The flu originated in the United States, but Spain, which was neutral during World War I, and unlike its European neighbors, it did not impose wartime censorship on the press. So in France, England, and the United States, newspapers weren't allowed to report on anything that could harm the war effort, including news that a crippling virus was sweeping through the troops. Spanish journalists were some of the only ones reporting on a widespread flu outbreak in the spring of 1918. And as a result, the pandemic became known as the Spanish flu. Once again, the flu originated in the United States. But since only Spain was allowed to report it, it got the misnomer Spanish flu. But as the war was drawing to a close, somewhere in Europe, a mutated strain of the Spanish flu virus emerged and that had the power of killing a perfectly healthy young man or woman within 24 hours of showing the first signs of infection. So as the war concluded and military ships started departing, the flu started making its way back to the home countries of these soldiers and notable among them was the United States. So, so returning soldiers from Europe ended up infecting among others, countries and cities, the United States as well. And this deadly second wave triggered the global pandemic, with the World War I troop movement proving to be the carrier of this flu. And it had the most bizarre mode of death. So infected people would be struck with blistering fevers, nasal hemorrhage and pneumonia, and patients would drown in their own fluid-filled lungs. Many decades later, this phenomenon ended up being known as psychotine explosion, uh, which is when the human body is being attacked by a virus, the immune system sends a uh, message of proteins called cytokines to promote healthful inflammation. But some strains of the flu, particularly the H1N1 strain, responsible for the Spanish flu, triggered a dangerous immune overreaction in healthy individuals. In those cases, the body ended up getting overloaded with cytokines, leading to severe inflammation and fatal buildup of fluid in the lungs. The British military doctors conducting autopsies on soldiers killed by the second wave of the Spanish flu described the heavy damage to the lungs as akin 
to the effects of chemical warfare. Yes, this was no minor pandemic. It was akin to chemical warfare. Looking back, uh, one of the core reasons for the rapid spread of the Spanish flu in the fall of 1918 was that the public health officials were unwilling to impose quarantines during wartime. As I'd mentioned before, the press was censored, so um, anything else that could lead to awareness that there was a flu going on was looked as a no-no. Moreover, in the United States, the um, response to the crisis was further hampered by a severe nursing shortage as thousands of nurses had been deployed to military camps uh, on the front lines during World War I. And the shortage was further worsened by American Red Cross's refusal to use trained African-American nurses until the worst of the pandemic had already passed. Wait, why did they refuse to use African-American nurses at the height of the pandemic? Well, segregation was still there. And American Red Cross felt that during the war effort, they could not find suitable housing for these nurses. And it was only after the pandemic had reached unmanageable and deadly proportions that the American Red Cross relented and allowed the first batch of 18 African-American nurses to serve in the RP Nurse Corps between December 1918 and August 1919. So the pandemic helped break down a racial barrier and this batch of 18 nurses would later on be referred to as the 18 of 1918. So the common thread so far between the Spanish flu and the COVID pandemic has been the relative suppression of information and underreporting of numbers. But there is more. So as the devastating second wave of the Spanish flu hit American shores um, due to the returning soldiers from World War I, the disease started spreading to the general population especially in the densely crowded cities. Now, without a vaccine or approved treatment plan, it fell to the local mayors and health officials to uh, improvise plans to safeguard the safety of their residents. So officials in some communities imposed quarantines, ordered citizens to wear masks and shut down public places, including schools, churches and theaters. Uh, people were advised to avoid shaking hands and to stay indoors. Libraries put a halt on lending books and regulations were passed banning spitting. Um, according to the New York Times, during the pandemic, uh, the Boy Scouts in New York City uh, would often approach people they had seen spitting on the street and give them a card that read, you're in violation of the sanitary code. Residents in San Francisco were fined $5, a significant sum at the time, uh, if they were caught in public without masks and charged with uh, disturbing the peace. Philadelphia's response, though, went in the opposite direction. The director of public health and charities for the city insisted that the mounting fatalities were not the Spanish flu, but rather just the normal flu. So on September 28, 1918, the city went forward with a Liberty Loan Parade attended by tens of thousands of Philadelphians spreading the disease like wildfire. In just 10 days, over 1,000 Philadelphians were dead and another 200,000 sick. Only then did the city close salons and theaters. But by March 1919, over 15,000 residents of Philadelphia had lost their lives. St. Louis, Missouri, on the other hand, was a little different. Schools and movie theaters closed and public gatherings were banned. Consequently, the peak mortality rate in St. Louis was just one-eighth of Philadelphia's death rate during the peak of the pandemic. And there's more. With no cure for the flu, many doctors prescribed medication that they felt would alleviate the symptoms, including aspirin. So patients were advised to take up to 30 grams per day. For comparison's sake, 
the medical consensus today is that doses above four grams are unsafe. And at the time, the patients were being advised to take 30 grams per day. And these high doses led to aspirin poisoning in many patients. And in fact, it is believed that many of the October deaths were actually caused or hastened by aspirin poisoning. So the same precautions applied even then. Social distancing, wearing masks, and avoiding public gatherings. Overall, the Spanish flu affected about 28% of all Americans and claimed the lives of an estimated 675,000 in the US. So there are three factors uh, that come in play during an epidemic. The source, the containment, and the vaccine. Now, the containment of an epidemic becomes difficult, especially in a well-connected uh, world that we live in. So it is extremely important to report the emergence of a new virus or illness in a timely fashion. And even more important is to react to the report and build defensive measures against it in a timely fashion. In case of COVID-19, we fell short on both counts. First, China underwent denial for more than a month after the new virus was first reported in Wuhan, going to the extent of even reprimanding the medical professionals who reported it. And this behavior from a global superpower and a permanent member of the UN Security Council is definitely very questionable. And the second failing was that the rest of the world did not implement defenses against the virus in time. Even now, a lot of countries do not have adequate testing infrastructure to determine the blast radius. So what are the new changes we should implement to prevent the spread of viruses in the future that cause pandemics? One of the core areas of concern has been that we are still uh, reporting on illnesses using 19th century techniques. So the core is how can we get better at timely reporting of illnesses. And one of the suggestions that has recently come out from the WHO is to act on unofficial data on social media, despite questions of accuracy. Interesting. So the social media is becoming an interesting platform with respect to sharing of information. And if the WHO does start acting on that, the information about spread of new illnesses or viruses may have the chance of being reacted upon in a timely manner um, instead of relying on the bureaucratic infrastructure or the government controlled uh, information machinery. And on that note, we conclude this section of this program. Moving on to the quiz segment. The question in the previous episode, what event triggered the start of the Cold War? A, the Berlin blockade of 1948. B, the Potsdam Conference of 1945. C, the defection of Igor Gozenko in 1945. Or D, the announcement of the Marshall Plan in 1947. Igor Sergeyevich Gozenko was a cipher clerk for the Soviet Embassy in Canada in Ottawa. He defected on 5th of September 1945, three days after the end of World War II, with 109 documents on the Soviet Union's espionage activities in the West. This forced Canada's Prime Minister to call a royal commission to investigate espionage in Canada. Gozenko exposed Soviet intelligence efforts to steal nuclear secrets, as well as the technique of planting sleeper agents. The Gozenko affair is often credited as a triggering event of the Cold War. So the answer to the question is C, the defection of Igor Gozenko in 1945. On to the quiz question for this week's episode. Which one has been the most effective vaccine of all time? 
by most effective meaning the degree of eradication of the disease per dose administered is it a the smallpox vaccine by edward jenner in 1796 b the polio vaccine by jonas salk in 1955 c the mmr vaccine combined by maurice hillman in 1971 or d the typhoid vaccine by edward wright in 1896 once again which one has been the most effective vaccine of all time a the smallpox vaccine by edward jenner in 1796 b the polio vaccine by jonas salk in 1955 c the mmr vaccine combined by maurice hillman in 1971 or D, the typhoid vaccine by Edward Wright in 1896? The answer will be provided in the next episode. That's all we have in this episode. For the next episode, we take you through the history of the most important asset of the 20th century. Not the Suez Canal. This asset is petroleum. Yes, we'll travel through time and see how petroleum became such an important asset that it started influencing the rise and fall of governments and big enterprises. Till then, stay safe and continue to explore the why in history.